It stretched from the Pacific Ocean to the fringes of Western Europe. The Soviet Empire seemed invincible. But in 1989, the Iron Curtain was swept away and Moscow watched its empire crumble. Thirty years on, Russia is reasserting itself. There are fears of new flashpoints in Europe. The Baltic has become one of the front lines of what feels like a new Cold War. As Russia pushes for greater influence, I ask its leader how he sees his country. But will a global pandemic curb the Kremlin's global ambitions? We are now facing a totally different Russia, a totally different Putin and a very weakened regime. I'm on a journey that will take me back to 1989 and across Europe to find out what it was like for Moscow to lose an empire and what Russia is doing to rebuild its power. Moscow. It's a city that oozes empire. From the skyscrapers of Joseph Stalin to the residents of the Tsars, the message is unmistakable. This is a country with ambition. Throughout its history, Russia has had an unswerving belief in its own greatness. You can see that in the Kremlin. This is stunning. Look at this. This says power, omnipotence. This says empire. By the end of the 19th century, the Russian Empire spanned one-sixth of the surface of the world. Inside the Kremlin, you can really feel the imperial ambition which has driven Russia for centuries. For example, all these double-headed eagles, Russia's national emblem, that symbol is straight out of the Byzantine Empire. And over there, you can see the throne of the Russian emperor, the Russian Tsar. That word, Tsar, comes from Caesar, the Roman Empire. And till this day, there are Russians who will tell you that the natural successor to the great empires of Rome and Constantinople is Moscow. Russia never was a normal country. Russians do not know how to live in a normal country. Russia was built as an empire. Russia has existed as an empire. Because the essence is we are great, we have to have areas of influence, and we have to have buffer states between ourselves and the outside world. So this is an empire. It was communist Russia that would acquire the mother of all buffer zones. In World War II, as the Red Army pushed Hitler's troops back, Central and Eastern Europe fell under Moscow's control. On paper, most of these countries were independent. In reality, the Kremlin called the shots in what was now the Soviet Empire. As Cold War set in, this buffer zone not only gave Moscow a sense of security, it made it a superpower. Until 1989, this was the year people power brought down the Iron Curtain. Across Europe, communist regimes fell like dominoes. Even parts of the Soviet Union itself were now openly defying the Kremlin. 
комментарии, телемосты, информации. Viewed from Moscow, these events were earth-shattering. You could feel a giant empire tearing at the seams. In 1989, I was a student in Moscow. I was studying Russian here. And I can remember that every night I'd sit down to watch the television news. What I saw, what millions of viewers here saw, was truly remarkable. The Soviet Empire falling apart, piece by piece. Could what happened then explain Russia now? I've spent nearly 30 years living and working in Moscow. And what I see is a country that's still struggling to come to terms with the loss of its empire. People often ask me, why does modern Russia do what it does? Why does it meddle in other countries' elections and launch cyber attacks against the West? Why does Moscow seem so keen to play the role of geopolitical spoiler? I think that the key to deciphering Vladimir Putin's Russia lies in 1989. To understand today's Russia, first, you need to understand what Moscow lost 30 years ago, what it lost in terms of power and prestige, in terms of empire. There was one place in Europe where Moscow found its loss of empire especially painful. In what was communist East Berlin, there is a Soviet war memorial and a cemetery. 7,000 Red Army soldiers are buried here. In total, the Soviet Union lost 27 million people in World War II. That scale of sacrifice, Moscow believed, gave it the moral right to make part of Germany part of the Soviet Empire. So what it says here is eternal glory to the soldiers of the Soviet army who gave their lives in the battle to liberate humanity from the slavery of fascism. In other words, it was the Red Army that saved the world. Moscow turned East Germany into a fortress. Today, there is something ghostly about the Soviet legacy. Red Army bases lie abandoned, haunted by memories of communism, monuments to a fallen superpower. This is Wunsdorf, near Berlin. It was used by the Nazis and then seized by the Soviets. It was the Red Army's largest base outside the USSR. The soldiers called it Little Moscow. East Germans knew it as the Forbidden City. The scale of the Soviet military presence in East Germany was staggering. There were 800 garrisons here and half a million Soviet troops. But then again, for Moscow, this was its key outpost in Europe. And its East German comrades were happy to play host. Besatzungsmacht hin, Besatzungsmacht her. 
Wir haben die sowjetischen Truppen auf unserem Territorium immer als Freunde betrachtet. Ich liebe Russland. Ich liebte die Sowjetunion. Die Sowjetunion hat an der Wiege der DDR gestanden. Und die Sowjetunion hat leider auch am Sterbebett der DDR gestanden. The Wunsdorf Base feels suspended in time. There are places here where the Soviet past comes to life. Oh wow, look at this. This is amazing. This says Berlin Operation 1945. This shows the Red Army's last major offensive at the end of World War II. So these arrows, this is the Soviet troops advancing on Berlin. Communist Russia thought its ideas, its ideology, would bind East Germany to Moscow forever. But it was wrong. When the Berlin Wall fell, everything changed. Within a year, East and West Germany had reunited. Moscow agreed to withdraw its troops. With a sense of a big historical injustice, that they came together and they left one day. A country that made the main part of the fascism of fascism. They left, and the others were left. Is there a question? Anton Tirentiev was the commander at Wunsdorf. Now he's back from Moscow for an official event commemorating Russia's withdrawal. The general tells me he was the last Russian soldier to leave Germany. Западные политики, что НАТО не подвинется на восток ни на один шаг, что будет мир и спокойствие. А подошли не только к границам, подошли к забору, мало того, к воротам. И еще возмущается, что мы их не открываем. The fall of the wall didn't only have consequences for Soviet soldiers. But Soviet spies too. In the first file, um, there is the past of Vladimir Putin. With his past, he could go in the Stasi building here in Dresden because he, he was a liaison officer between the KGB and the Stasi. In Dresden, this archive keeps the records of East Germany's secret police, the Stasi and the documents of KGB officers who operated here, like Vladimir Putin. And here we got a photo where you can find Vladimir Putin. Where is he? Oh, maybe oh on the end? Yes. Wow, it's amazing to think that this grey figure at the end went on to become president of Russia. Astonishing. In December 1989, a crowd stormed the Stasi offices in Dresden and took control. A small group of protesters moved away from the Stasi building and came here. This is where the KGB headquarters were. And inside the building was Vladimir Putin. So what did Major Putin do? Well, he telephoned the local Soviet tank commander to ask for urgent backup. But the message which came back was this. I've asked Moscow to sign off on that, but Moscow is silent. That was the moment that Vladimir Putin realized his motherland had abandoned him. At the Rancho Stalin Alley. At the Stalin Alley, brother? At the Stalin Alley. 
Egon Krentz says that Moscow abandoned him too. He claims that at this meeting, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev assured him German reunification wouldn't happen. He accuses Gorbachev of surrendering to America. Und er hatte mir vorher am 24. November eine persönliche Botschaft geschickt, in der er mitteilte, dass er vorhat, auf dieser Beratung mit Bush den Kalten Krieg für beendet zu erklären. Aber das wurde dann zum Bumerang. Er erklärte gegenüber Bush, wir sind der Meinung, der Kalte Krieg ist zu Ende. Und Bush sagte, und wir haben ihn gewonnen. Das heißt, die Erklärung Gorbatschows über das Ende des Kalten Krieges war zugleich eine amerikanische Demütigung der Russen, die den Kalten Krieg für beendet erklären, aber als, Nieder äh, als Niederlage empfunden. Ja, wo du schon... Mikhail Gorbachev rejects criticism of his leadership. He's fiercely proud of his role in ending the Cold War. Да даже Маргарет Тэтчер. Да, да. И, конечно, и французы хотели. Мы заявили, что мы не будем вмешиваться. Это дело немцев. Пусть они решат. It would take Moscow four years to bring all its troops home. But to what kind of a country were they coming back? The Soviet Union had gone. Russia was struggling. The returning soldiers were low priority. Vyacheslav had commanded a tank battalion in Germany, the 16th Guards Division. Its mission, he says, was to defend the motherland and Moscow's allies in Eastern Europe. They were an elite unit, but there was nothing elite about the conditions to which they returned. There were no facilities, there was no accommodation, nowhere for their families to live. It was almost as if they'd been forgotten. Техника, которая выходила из Наштрелец, размещалась вот на этом поле. То есть, получается, все танки здесь стояли, да? Да, все танки, артиллерия, зенитные, все, все, вся дивизия здесь стояла вот на этом поле. А где вы жили? Я жил в своем вагончике в парке. Уходили-то, оставляя нормальные как говорится, парки, полигоны, а сюда приходили на голое место. Конечно же, шок. Даже и то, что семей не было год. Многие семьи пораспадались, потому что не все это выдержали, как говорится, трудности. You know, I think that in many ways, Vyacheslav's story encapsulates what happened to his country after 1989. 
the Soviet Union, this giant superpower, suddenly found itself dumped on the sidelines of history. And as a result, Russia felt abandoned, it felt lost, and it felt humiliated. Perhaps if the end of the Cold War had brought instant prosperity to people here, then maybe this loss of status, this loss of empire, would have been easier to swallow. But it didn't. The 1990s brought economic chaos and widespread poverty. So what you had here, in effect, was a fertile soil for any strongman promising to make Russia great again. Enter President Vladimir Putin. He's been trying to erase the memory of Russia's humiliation and to celebrate more glorious chapters of its history. Like the victory in World War II. It's the annual Victory Day Parade in Moscow. You know, there are 13,000 Russian troops marching across the Red Square right now and making a lot of noise. It's an incredible showcase, really, of modern Russian military might. This isn't just about celebrating a victory in the past. It's very much about the present. It's about Vladimir Putin showing his people and the world that Russia has bounced back. That it's a country that wants to be respected to be feared and to be counted. In Vladimir Putin's Russia, 1945 is at the heart of the national idea. Sometimes these symbols of the past make it feel as if the Kremlin dreams of bringing the Soviet Union back to life. But modern Russia isn't simply reinventing the USSR, its methods are different. These people in the Kremlin do understand that idea of restoration of the former superpower is, is impossible. But they have other idea, and the idea is to be a blackmailer, to be producer of mischief, to be the grand spoiler in the world, to be the nightmare for the neighbors and for the outside countries. So this is the new idea of superpower and, and empire. In the next episode, the mischief begins. How Russia's been flexing its military muscle. The main problem of Russia is that they still believe in the idea of spheres of influence. And spreading disinformation. Adolf Hitler is more popular than Harry Potter. It's absolute fake. You're pushing the Kremlin's narrative. Beyond the smiles, a new standoff with the West. It's a colossal but Power games in a pandemic. Russia playing geopolitics. But now, problems at home. He's frozen. He's stalled. He cannot react. He cannot say anything. As COVID-19 hits, will a virus rob President Putin of his ambition to restore Russia's greatness? Throughout its history, Russia has swung between wanting to be part of Europe and competing with the West. Right now, it's set on rivalry. And that risks confrontation especially with the kind of methods Moscow's been employing close to home. They call it the jewel of the Black Sea.
Crimea. Once part of the Roman Empire, it fell to the Ottomans, then to the Tsars and the Soviets. Most recently, it's been part of Ukraine. But the beauty belies geopolitical tension, for Crimea has become a flashpoint between East and West. This is why. In 2014, masked soldiers in unmarked uniforms seized control of a Ukrainian peninsula, Crimea. They acquired the nickname the Little Green Men, but they were Russian special forces sent in by President Putin after Ukraine's pro-Western revolution. At a hastily organized referendum, voters backed joining Russia, but the poll widely condemned, wasn't internationally recognized. It had taken Moscow less than a month to occupy and annex a piece of its neighbor. For many Russians, this was cause for celebration. I first met Ira in Moscow back in the early 1990s. She has a second home now in Crimea. Emotionally, it means very much, because um, just if we look back into the history, I mean, two or three centuries back, since that time, uh, the Crimean history has always been connected with Russia. In the West, as you know, there's a lot of criticism of Vladimir Putin for what happened here, for Russia taking Crimea. I am very grateful to Mr. Putin, and I take my hat off and bow my head to Mr. Putin because he saved the uh, generations of the Crimean uh, uh, people from rivers of blood here. There would be a war because of those extremists who might have come from the Ukraine to settle their own rules here. That's what I think. In Sevastopol, they're marking Russian Navy Day. And center stage is the Black Sea Fleet. It's an opportunity to showcase Russian power at sea. Since it annexed Crimea, Russia has become the dominant force in the Black Sea. It's upgraded its fleet. More ships, more weapons, and new missions. Some of these ships have taken part in Russia's military operation in Syria. After its annexation of Crimea, Russia has consolidated its control here and increased its presence in the Black Sea. It's using that as a springboard to project power far beyond this region into the Mediterranean, the Balkans and the Middle East. At NATO headquarters, Russia's actions are causing alarm and disappointment. At the end of the Cold War, a partnership with the Kremlin seemed achievable. There was even talk that Russia might one day join NATO. That idea seems pie in the sky now. What we see is a pattern of behavior where Russia um, is responsible for aggressive actions against neighbors. That reflects that the main problem of Russia is that they still uh, believe in the idea of spheres of influence. Of the 30 NATO countries, nine of them used to be in Moscow's zone of influence. It's a change in the balance of power that unnerves Russia. One complaint I often hear from Russian officials is that 30 years ago, uh, a promise was made by the West to Moscow that NATO would not enlarge and move closer to, to Russia's borders. And Russia says, the West deceived Moscow. 
So first of all, uh, no sort, such promise was uh, made. But second, just the idea that uh, uh, Washington or a big Western ally should promise that to Moscow is an idea based on a totally wrong assumption that big countries can promise something on behalf of small countries. Since Russia took Crimea, NATO has bolstered its forces near Russia's borders. In the Baltic, it strengthened its air policing mission. From Estonia's Amari Air Base, NATO jets are regularly scrambled. Their main task is to intercept Russian planes that are approaching Estonian airspace, which have failed to identify themselves. Over the Baltic Sea, Typhoon jets intercept two Russian military aircraft and escort them from the area. This piece of land is, is ours and nobody else's. Russia wants to assert their dominance over the Baltic's area on land and on sea, so the subtle message of theirs is uh, this is our uh, territory keep out and our uh, response to them is no you're wrong this is uh, western territory nato's territory and uh, we are here to uh, let you know do you really believe that russia is a threat to estonia as long as russia as such does not change their stance towards the west uh, they can be a threat to smaller neighbors Moscow dismisses the idea that it's a threat to the Baltic. But NATO is taking no chances. After what happened in Crimea, for the NATO alliance, the security of the three Baltic states is a priority. The Baltic has become one of the front lines of what feels like a new Cold War between Russia and the West. To Moscow, the presence of NATO troops near its border is a direct threat to Russia's national security. But NATO insists that all of this is purely defensive and a reaction to an increasingly assertive and aggressive Russia. Насколько опасно, по вашему мнению, нынешнее противостояние России Запад? Пока есть особенно оружие и массовое уничтожение, и я единое в первую очередь Это колоссальная опасность. Причем может это произойти независимо от политических решений. Поэтому нельзя допустить этого. Вот все народы должны заявить, все народы, что ядерное оружие должно быть уничтожено. Как бы вы сегодня назвали э, противостояние России и Запада? Это холодная война, это что-то другое. Охлажденная на война. Russia's new assertiveness goes beyond its military. Vladimir Putin's Kremlin has a whole range of instruments for exerting influence. And one of these tools Russia employs against many European countries, including Latvia. In 1989, Latvia was part of the Soviet Union. It's in the EU now, and in NATO. But Moscow still casts a shadow. Today, Latvia is a target of Russian disinformation. There is an attempt to distort reality here by spreading fake news, to sow doubt confusion. Russia's objective, to discredit a European democracy on its border. And here's one example of what appears to be Russian disinformation. This website is called Balt News. It's in Russian. It's aimed at ethnic Russians across the Baltic. But it's part of a news organisation which is bankrolled by the Kremlin. 
Now, what kind of stories does it put out? Well, here's one. Listen to this. Among Latvians, it says, Adolf Hitler is more popular than Harry Potter. Hitler's Mein Kampf tops the reader's book choice in Latvia. Astonishing. So the impression you get when you read this is that in Latvia, in an EU country, Nazi ideology is thriving. And this story was picked up and republished by a whole string of other news sites. But is it really true? I'm off to investigate. My first stop is Latvia's largest bookseller. Harry's here, but I can't find Hitler. Perhaps Inara, the company director, can help me. How many copies of Mein Kampf were sold in your shop, say, in 2018? None. Not a single copy? Not a single copy. Is it not available, then, in the, in the bookshops in that? No, it is not available. What do you think about this claim, then, that in Latvia, Adolf Hitler is more popular than Harry Potter? <laughs> it's nonsense. It's absolute fake. I head across to the National Library in Riga. If Latvians aren't buying Mein Kampf, then perhaps they're borrowing it? Now, the National Library tells me that in the last three years, they've only received 39 requests for Mein Kampf. And if you look at the statistics from across the country, the grand total from all the libraries in Latvia, Mein Kampf has only been requested 139 times in three years. Compare that to 25,000 requests to borrow Harry Potter books. I track down the key link to the book news story. It's Rita. She runs a second-hand book website in Latvia. Bolt News had based its report on data from her site. Now, in its article, Bolt News claims that on your site, Mein Kampf has been one of the most clicked on titles. In fact, there's a section on your site which shows the, the books which are gaining the most interest from users. And until recently, Mein Kampf was right up there near the top. How do you explain that? They are page views, they are not the real deals. So it's interesting that for this Mein Kampf, about 70% of all the clicks are anonymous clicks. And if we compare with uh, other most popular books like Harry Potter, 70% are registered users. So if most of the clicks for Mein Kampf are anonymous, unregistered users, yeah. What does that mean? They can be fake users or uh, internet trolls or whatever, how we call them. Fake views to, to make fake news? Yeah, definitely. The fundamental aim of the Russian operation is undermine the other countries. Russia cannot tolerate the success of the Baltics that have embraced freedoms and values of the West and can be successful. A good example is very dangerous, so you should taint it. Everything I've been told here proves, I think, that this Hitler story is 100% fake news. There's just one more conversation I'd like to have, though, and that's with the people who published the story, Bolt News. But the thing is, Bolt News doesn't have an office here in Latvia. So to speak to them, I'm going to have to go back to Moscow. In Moscow, I've come to the headquarters of the state-run media giant, Rosia Sivodnya. It transmits the Kremlin's view to the world. Bolt News is one of its outlets. Your editorial policy is the Kremlin's editorial policy, right? You're, you're pushing the Kremlin's narrative. We are the Russian government inform agency. Of course, the official Russian narrative is given to us. Why don't you publish a piece 
that says Harry Potter is much more popular in Latvia than Mein Kampf. Это не является актуальным сюжетом. Он не находится в актуальной политической повестке. But it's the true situation, it's the truth. Сегодня лето. Это тоже реальная фиксация факта. Но, наверное, BBC не интересно будет сегодня издать материал о том, что сейчас на улице лето. Can a country be simultaneously the grand spoiler and a great power? Does modern Russia even want the title superpower? This is my chance to ask the president. Vladimir Putin has just finished an event near the Kremlin. It's a rare opportunity to get up close to the Kremlin leader. Можно вопрос, Владимир Владимирович? Спасибо большое. BBC News. Еще, господин президент, как вы думаете, Россия вновь сверхдержава? Мы не стремимся к этому статусу. Мы не хотим вернуться к тому состоянию, в котором находился Советский Союз, когда он навязывал своим соседям, в том числе странам Восточной Европы, образ жизни, политическую систему и так далее. Этот печальный опыт Советского Союза не учитывается некоторыми нашими партнерами на Западе. Они повторяют те же самые ошибки, исходя из того, что они сами являются империями и, и, и строят свою политику именно в имперском ключе. Vladimir Putin set out to restore Russia's status as a global player. And everything seems to have been going according to plan. Until now. Suddenly, the whole world has changed. COVID-19 has put Russia and most of the planet into lockdown. For now, Cold War has been superseded by a battle with a virus. For Russians, the priority isn't being a superpower, it's survival. This is eerie. It feels as if someone has pressed a giant pause button and the world's largest country has come to a standstill. The pandemic threatens to decimate Russia's economy. A crash in global oil prices is making things even worse. There are forecasts of a long, deep recession. We are now facing a totally different Russia, a totally different Putin and a very weakened regime. Vladimir Putin wants to be seen as being in control, leading from the front. He's come to visit a hospital for coronavirus patients. But this is not the kind of battle the Kremlin is used to. For years, it's been telling Russians that the threat to their security comes from NATO, from America, the West. It turns out that Russia has more to fear from an invisible enemy. No risk is with the epidemic, peak that is not broken, the Putin on Russian TV is a decisive leader, at the center of power. But on coronavirus, his critics accuse him of delay, mixed messaging, and of not doing nearly enough to protect the economy. He is not an adaptive politician who can react to external challenges. 
because we see many world leaders really jump on this train and trying to take over and trying to rule the events. And Putin is, uh, it's, he's in lockdown, he's frozen, he's stalled. He cannot react, he cannot say anything either to the world or to the Russian nation. Every nation is under pressure from this pandemic. But after years of chronic underfunding, Russia's public health system has been stretched to the limits. Изолирована палата. Это вот такая одноразовая пеленка. But amid the crisis at home, Moscow is sending aid abroad. The Russian army has been in Italy to help tackle the epidemic there. Russia saying, we are still power, we are still power, we have possibility to help you. No little green men. This time, it was the boys in blue. They presented this as a mercy mission. But images of the Russian military in an EU and NATO country are a propaganda coup for Moscow. It's good for geopolitics, it's good for another country, but I think it's not rather good for us because the priority is uh, own country, not another. The pandemic is the biggest challenge for Moscow since the fall of its empire 30 years ago. But it hasn't extinguished its determination to regain influence and to be seen as strong. For Russia, the real lesson of 1989, when the Iron Curtain lifted, is that weakness costs power. The paradox is that today's Russia wants to forget about 1989. It was, yes, an amazing period, but it was the period of backtracking, surrender, defeat. So the Kremlin wants victory, wants omnipotence, wants domination, and tries to forget about this kind of nightmare. When the Berlin Wall fell, I remember thinking that from now on, everything was going to be different. It was going to be better. That East and West were going to join hands and walk off into the sunset together. A happy end, Hollywood style. Well, that didn't work out. I wonder what will happen now. What kind of a world will the pandemic leave behind? Will this global crisis finally convince East and West and North and South to set aside their differences and work together? Or will the fallout from the virus be so immense that it will increase geopolitical tension and the search for scapegoats and end up building new barriers, new walls?